This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon everybody, it's 34 degrees here, 95 degrees Fahrenheit in the middle of the Kruger National Park. This is Safari Live. Any sensible creature at this time of the day, of course, is sitting in the shade or reclining on a bough in a leafy tree like this one, Scotia brachypatella, or the weeping boar bean. That is the tree that I'm in now. You are most welcome. We're on the sunset safari, although by the time we finish our drive, three hours hence, uh, it's the sun will maybe just have set. It'll be six o'clock and I think the temperature may have dropped by only two degrees. On the other vehicle, we have Jamie Patterson. She is being filmed by Brian and the Thumb, and they are making their weary way through the volcanic atmosphere, hopefully to some lions. On camera today with me is jean -Dre. Hello, jean -Dre. Hello, James. Yeah, it's lovely to have you with me. I see that you are wearing your car tire sandals. Very nice. What a pity they weren't lost in your expedition to Biffle's Hook the other day. Anyway, that is the matter for another time. In the final control, Kirsten McLennan Smithereens is being helped ably by Louise Pavid. She is having an Energade bottle because it is so very hot today. 34 degrees, like I said. Now, I'm going to attempt a graceful dismount from this tree. And then we are going to go to Cheetah Plains. Eh. Can you still hear me, jean -Ray? Yes. Oh, God. Now, this morning, for those of you who were on drive, and if you weren't, well, you're to be thoroughly scolded for your tardiness. We saw some lions. Well, we didn't. I saw nothing. But Jamie saw the male lions. And, um, oh, gosh. This is getting hairy, everybody. It's okay. I'm all right. And some elephant, a couple of warthogs. But for me, the most interesting thing, I think, was the marabou stalk that we saw at uh, Arethusa Dam, and that precipitated a discussion of the Ugly Five. Now, my Ugly Five... <laughs> I can't get out of this tree. My Ugly Five turned out to be the marabou stalk, the whip scorpion, the uh, burrowing... What was it? The naked mole rat that was the other one. Um, I think the drunken tourist was, the, was another. And I forget exactly what the other one was. Anyway, uh, one very kind viewer said that they thought I should be part of the Ugly Five. Um, which I thought was a little bit, bit nasty. But, um, you know, everyone is entitled to their own opinion. <laughs> so, here we go. If I, you are part of the group of people that think I should be part of the Ugly Five, well... A bit out of breath, though. I hope you don't mind being with a member of the Ugly Five. I'm a little bit out of breath, Sean. I was a bit scared there that I was going to come toppling out of the tree. But in the end, all was okay. Okay. Shall we go to Cheetah Plains? We're going to Cheetah Plains because it is so very hot and they've got lots of water there and I'm hoping there'll be elephants there, cheetahs, lions, wild dogs, jackals and, of course, an ostrich. Right, on we go. Please do talk to us during the course of the afternoon. Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or questions at wildearth.tv if you're on the email. And while we extricate ourselves from under the shade of this very leafy and beautiful Scotia tree, let's head across to Pajamas Patterson and find out how her search for the lions is going. <laughs> Good afternoon and hello and welcome to the Sunset Safari. Uh, my name is not Pajamas, although... Well, perhaps it will eventually start to morph into pyjamas. My name is Jamie, and the man behind the camera is Brian. What's the thumb today, Brian? A sweaty thumb. A sweaty thumb, for it is indeed very, very warm this afternoon. 
Uh, James took the approach of hiding out under the shade of a Scotia tree. Brian and myself have taken a different approach. We're not stopping. Um, we're just going to keep moving and utilize the natural air conditioning unit of the vehicle. Although if we think we have it bad, the first animal that we're about to pop around the corner and see, he probably has it just that little bit worse. Oh, imagine being a water buck today, Brian. Ooh, ooh. <coughs> Excuse me. Here we go, I've got shade here. But we can't see the water buck, but I've got shade. <laughs> Here we go, starting off our boiling hot afternoon safari with one very fluffy antelope. Of course, told you that they are, well, I mentioned that they've got these very fluffy coats. It's not too warm for them, so they don't actually run the risk of overheating. The fibers of the coats are relatively hollow and quite spread out which means that they don't overheat completely because as you can imagine it would be a very poor design indeed it would be a design flaw one might say to have an antelope in the deepest African bush that has a very thick fur coat so it's there to protect them from being from water when they spend a considerable period of time wandering about in rivers and the like but they are adapted so that they do not overheat completely so this afternoon we have returned to Hyena Road to see whether or not we will be able to track down and find the Nkuhuma Pride that have spent a great deal of time around this area. At some point they do need to go and find some more food which could include a water buck. There's lots and lots of water buck on this particular stretch of road. A waterbuck, of course, is a particularly attractive animal. We were chatting this morning about the ugly five and the different ones that you could see, and Brian raised a very, very good point, and I think that we should ask Mr. Hendry about this as he goes along his sunset safari. And that is, if we have the ugly five, well, we most definitely need to have the beautiful five as well. But what would be included on your beautiful five list? We'll have to talk about animals here, although I think James was starting to chat about things like those sphinx cats and all kinds of different creatures. But if you had to talk about your beautiful five, what would it be? Brian says no big five, don't you, Brian? Yeah. No leopards and lions, because that's cheating. Well, they're part of the big five. They're part of the big five. So no big five. I suppose rhino are lovely, but you wouldn't really put them on the most beautiful list. Well, maybe you would. I don't know. Uh, but James apparently, upon hearing this news from Kirsty that we decided he should talk about the beautiful five as well, is pointing at himself. Okay, so we've got a spot on the list for Mr. Hendry. It's amazing he can squeeze in there with that <laughs> that approach. Uh, somebody's going to say lilac-breasted roller. I guarantee it. And they are very beautiful. But do they, do they merit a spot on the top five most beautiful creatures? Personally, I don't think the warthog belong on that list. So there you go. So, a discussion for this afternoon. What animals do you think should be on the beautiful fiver? I think that James was busy talking about, as I said, things outside of Africa, like sphinx cats, although we do get them in South Africa, those bald, hairless creatures that are bizarre looking. I'm sure they're very sweet and apparently they have lovable characters. I'm not sure I would own one. I'm not sure Waterbuck is pretty enough to go on the top five list, is it, Brian? Not quite. They are pretty though. They are beautiful. <laughs> the fluffy five. <laughs> oh dear. Now, now we're starting all kinds of terrible lists. Next we're gonna have the cute list and the, uh, the, the angry list. The top five angry list? No. Okay, so let's stick with the top five most beautiful animals. The warthog, warthog, the waterbuck, I'm afraid, does not quite make the cut, for me anyway. They're still pretty, don't get me wrong, but not top five. Moving on, although this is quite a nice shade spot. I think we're going to see, go and see what else we can find. I'm going to do a loop around Hyena Road and then towards Gary Cutline. Rexon. Those of you, of course, who are familiar with Rexon, has suggested that he thinks they've been they're somewhere close around to where the males were. 
Uh, that will be our mission for this afternoon. I can imagine that the lions will be somewhere deep, deep in the shade, which is what Brian and myself are going to plan to do. We're going to jump from shady spot to shady spot. In the meantime, James has found something that probably won't make the most beautiful five, <coughs> but is certainly a wonderful animal. Elephants, everybody, and they are huddling in the shade. A great big herd of them standing beneath a torchwood tree. Is it a torchwood tree? Or is it a mangled jackalberry? I think it's a torchwood tree. And they're just sitting there trying to stay cool. And just watch their ears flapping to and fro as they cool the blood that comes from the heart to the ears and then into the brain, which keeps, of course, the nerve center of the animal very nice and cool. Now, while you look at them and contemplate the heat of this spring day, of course the beautiful five. Now, yeah, my beautiful five would consist, I believe, of the Nyala. I think the Bush Baby definitely be part of my uh, big five. Obviously, as a collective, the ladies of the final control would almost certainly be in my uh, beautiful five. Um, uh, the viewer who said that I should be part of the ugly five would be part of my beautiful five. And that's me turning the other cheek. And I need one more. <laughs> I think I'm going to go with the low-felt milkberry as the other part of the beautiful five. And the Cape Robin. Jondre, there's a very, very large warthog walking across the damn wall. He's just, I don't want to go any closer because I think he'll run over the other side. Can you see him there? There he is. A very large fellow. In fact, a very large Mrs. Warthog. She wouldn't be in the slightest but pleased to know that I'd mistaken her for a male. I wonder if we shouldn't go and have a little look at him. Her. It just looks to be slightly alarmed by whatever is the other side of the damn wall. Let's do a brief sojourn up here before we head back to Cheetah Plains. Those elephants are huddled in the shade. They're not coming closer and they're south of the boundary so we can't go any closer to them. So I think we'll leave them to rest up and let's see if there isn't something that is causing the consternation of this very large warthog sow. Hello Genevieve in New York. You want to know if I think my senses are heightened when I'm on drive uh, as opposed to when I'm not on drive. Genevieve, um, I think they are. I'm not sure that they're physically any different, but I think certainly my brain tunes them in much more effectively when I'm on drive or especially if I'm on a walk. If you're on a walk, you can't zone out ever. You've got to stay aware all the time. Whereas if you're on a drive, say, like we're about to sort of... She's very pregnant. Look how fat her belly is. When you're about to head to Cheetah Plains along that bit of road where there's no signal, um, you kind of, you can zone out, I guess, if it's really hot like it is now. She's very indecisive, this warthog. But on a walk, you can't do that, Genevieve, and so you've got to remain completely focused. But yeah, I think my senses definitely are heightened, but that's just because it's a, you know, you know they have to be. <laughs> I think a lot of people, Genevieve, you know why we watch that warthog sow disappear over the edge of the dam wall? A lot of people are under the impression that people who do the job that we do here have got sort of special eyes and special... Uh, ears and special noses, and we don't. We have, uh, in some cases, in my case, I don't have very special eyes at all. Um, but what we do have is just practice. It's practice using the senses that if you happen to live in New York, for example, you probably don't need. And indeed, you probably don't want some of the time. Sometimes I'm sure that your, your nose in a big city is a bit of a disadvantage, makes things slightly unpleasant. Likewise, your ears, you'll probably not use them nearly as much as you would out here because, of course, there's so much noise that your brain will automatically block 
quite a lot of it out whereas here that's completely different you want to pick up every single piece of information the audible information that's going on around us and the way to do that is just to practice it and your brain eventually tells you uh, well, your, your brain eventually um, doesn't tell your ears anything but it receives all of the information that goes into your ears as opposed to blocking some of it out and I think anyone can learn to do that, it's just practice. My nose and my ears are definitely much more sensitive out here than when I'm in the city. Righty, nothing majorly of consternation for the warthog there. And we'll just see if there hasn't been some kind of leopard crossing over the Umluamati drainage. See no tracks. Ah, James Richard, you say you're looking forward to the trip to Cheetah Plains and you were rather hoping that it would be on my agenda. Well, there it is. I'm glad to be of service, James. And I hope that um, it will bear some fruit for us. Perhaps the sticks pride. <laughs> perhaps some elephants at the water hole. Perhaps a cheetah and perhaps an ostrich. Right, we're about to sort of drop a gear and speed off a bit quicker, so let's go and find out how Jamie's doing, and I'll see you on the plains. While James races across to the plains, we are travelling to the west towards Gauri Cutline, and my plan is to go and see, and I think I can actually take this little route. No, let's go round. Me not to be lazy let me go around the fire break route my plan is to go and check where those cubs have been lying up for the last two or so days every time i think surely they must have moved on by now they keep seem to they keep seeming to pop up back up there so that's the plan oh, what was racing there there's a daker Phew. there it is little Daka there. It is between the Tambuertes there. Got it. So, Liz has said wild dog, serval, bee eater, kudu and serval. Did I get that right? Wild dog, serval, bee eater, kudu, giraffe. There we go. Well done, Liz. So that's your top five. Beautiful. I nearly, nearly managed to catch that one out of the air. Just on the subject of beautiful things. It was one of the... Sh it looks like a Shiraxis butterfly. Or possibly one of the emperors. I didn't see it for long enough. <laughs> Sorry, Brian. There's no way. I mean, I don't even know where it's gone now. <laughs> but there was a butterfly. I nearly managed to just touch it with my hands. That would have been a nice one to add on to our beautiful five. But I'm with Liz on, I agree with Liz about the kudu, although I'm not sure I would have put it on my, mmm, it's a difficult one. Kudus are be kudu is a beautiful antelope. I like wild dog, wild dog would go on my list, definitely. The painted wolf. Serval. You know what we haven't thought about, or I hadn't thought about up until now, was a caracal. Caracal are also tremendously beautiful. Are they more beautiful than the serval? I don't know. This is a. I've decided that Brian. I've decided this is far too difficult. The ugly five is easier. And Dr. Debbie, you said that the caracal would be in your top two, along with the kudu. So there you go. We've got one vote for the caracal and two for the kudu. I also really like bushbuck, but I think Nyala probably trump them in terms of beauty. Well, the kudu are also stunning. Can we just say spiral? No, we can't just say spiral horned antelope because Elant are awe inspiring, but they are not what I would, I wouldn't put them on the most beautiful list. Well, hold on, everybody. Going into the lion's favorite drainage line, or the favorite river system, and with all of its secret nook crannies you can understand why it's the perfect hiding spot if you're a little lion 
and not quite ready to face the big wide world yet. Although our little lion cubs have pretty much been facing the big wide world on a regular basis. And they are beautiful, which is why we have excluded them from this particular list, because otherwise they'd be on everybody's. What's your top five list, Brian? Tough one. It is a very tough one. I would say Sable. Sable? Ooh, Sable's a very good one. Sable, I didn't even think about. Have to think. Yeah, I'm going to have to think too. I'm asking you because I can't think of mine. <laughs> A sable is a magnificent antelope. I haven't seen one while I've been here. Of course, there was one seen for the first time in 18 years on the Juma Dam camera a couple of months ago. So a sable is a very, very nice suggestion. Called sable because of that beautiful velvet black color that their coat has with their backwards facing horns. They are truly stunning antelope. We need to go in here to check for these lions. I must say I'm going to be astounded if they're still here. But it would be a very, very nice surprise. Oops. There we go. So sable. I'm trying to only think of African animals because if I go further outside that oh no. Sphere. Oh no stay there then it gets very complicated because then you throw things like ocelots into the mix and an ocelot is really truly beautiful or a clouded leopard or something similar so let's stick to African animals Wisconsin, a brilliant and unique one coming from you. She has nominated a chameleon as the top of her list since they are so beautifully designed and so incredibly delicate. I love that. I think that's a really, really nice idea. We mustn't forget about our reptile family. And they truly are stunning creatures, chameleons. With their one, <laughs> My favorite thing about chameleon is their feet. They've got the most amazing feet. Those sort of toes that go like this. Mm. What about one of the snakes? We really do have some beautiful snakes. A puff adder is a gorgeous snake. The colors and the patterns of its scales. Come on lions. Come on lions. There's so much shade here. Why wouldn't you want to be here? We want to be here. very very carefully so I really like that idea a chameleon is a very good suggestion I wonder if they're in this drainage line let's just go check a little bit around the corner and then we'll do a closer examination on our way back through here and see if they're not in the drainage line itself they might be the thing is in these sorts of days you whilst the drainage lines or the river systems, the big dips, do provide plenty of shade, they also, it also means that the, the wind doesn't blow through because they're sheltered. So in turn, that means that you don't get the cooling breeze effect. So quite a few animals actually move up onto the shade on the edges of the drainage lines rather than lying in the middle of a drainage line so that they get the cooling effect of the breeze as well. warm welcome once again to RJ on the subject of our lions and while we go searching through here RJ wants to know whether or not lions ever get kicked out of their pride and if they do will they ever be able to go and join another one male lions always get kicked out of their pride so once they reach sexual maturity three and a half odd years old depending on whether or not they've got some coalition members with them but invariably a male lion will be forced out of his pride by either the females or 
There's a good chance by his father, or fathers, it's always a bit impossible to tell. I'm afraid to say our lions, if they are here, are very well hidden. It does occasionally happen with females as well. It's quite unusual. Most of the time a female will be in her pride for the rest of her life. Sometimes a pride does split. Often during a takeover and then doesn't necessarily come back together again. And then what will also sometimes happen is if a female has a problem with fertility, which is unusual with lions, they're quite fertile creatures, but if a a female has a problem with fertility, often the males pick up on it and they pay her less and less attention and the females seem to realize that there's something strange about her as well and then she might separate from the rest of the group. I saw it happen once, or at least I saw the after effects of that happen once with a female that was completely separate from her pride. She then went on to actually fall pregnant and have cubs but she never was accepted back into her original pride. In terms of being accepted by other lions, very, very rarely. Lions, are you here somewhere? Sure, it's so thick in here we could have driven past them. I don't want to jump out and give them a fright with the cubs. They'll go dashing off and we won't see them again. I think for once they are not hidden here. Or perhaps they are and they're just in the... What you got, Brian? No, Tree. <laughs> okay, cool. You got that intent focus look for a moment. I thought perhaps you'd spotted them. No, I don't think so. I'm sure they're in... Mm, I'm not sure they're in here actually. That's That's not true. I'm not sure they're in here at all. The cubs probably are. We haven't found any tracks for them coming out and they weren't seen on the dam camera yesterday. The lionesses were seen last night on the dam camera but the little cubs were not which means they probably are somewhere in this vicinity, in this region. The tracks haven't popped out of this block. The females were busy hunting last night so they've been all over the show. Sorry, just to go back, in terms of being accepted into a pride, another pride, it's very unusual and chances are that lion was already in some way known to that pride and it, it's happened with some males before, with young males before where they've gone and they've just been tolerated and accepted by the pride that they've come upon and it's usually explained by the fact that they are in some way related, perhaps a half-brother or something similar. Nope. No lions. And unfortunately this is the end of the road here. This is where the off-road tracks end from the last two days of sightings here. Just checking to see if there's any lion tracks. I'm not going to stay with this girl. Copy that, thank you. I've come down to the, around to the eastern side of that Gari cut line drainage. No sign of the Ngala here, um, unless they're deep in the Shkoba itself. Sorry, uh, Jamie. I've just checked there. Uh, there's no sign here. I'm going to check where the last month of Kofazi on the other side of um, uh, quarantine, there's a lot of cons going towards uh, Rebecca. Maybe on the ticket there, there might be a lot of fans to them. Okay, copy that. Thanks, Rickson. I'm going to make my way to that side. I'll give you a hand. Thank you. I'm just chatting to Rickson about what up. Ouch. <laughs> I just judged that one what our plans are for this afternoon and he said he doesn't think they're here anymore he thinks they're more towards Rebecca's Road so he's gonna go and check there we're gonna go and help him out the 
while we navigate our way out of here. Let's jump back on board with James, who has made it to the plains. I'm sure there's a rhyme in here somewhere, but let's go and have a look. I nearly had my glasses on everybody and that would have been very rude but we were just saying today that maybe we're going to have to wear our glasses because it's so very bright. Now, we had some consternation over this tree the other day. I took it home, I didn't know what it was. Brent identified it as a African plane tree. Judy H said she couldn't find evidence of any such tree and we couldn't find a decent botanical name for it. So I thought I'd pick a bigger piece of it and you can then have a look. The distinguishing marker, I think, other than the leaves, which are, well, they're pretty obviously normal, is these sort of packed plants. And they look like what we call a protea, and the protea is the country's national flower. But that's what they look like. So anybody who can add to the mystery of the African plane tree, that would be great. I'm pretty sure Brent's right, because he, des he described this, the, the flower almost exactly. So there it is. And maybe you can f help us find the botanical name. <laughs> right, on we go. Now, obviously on a day like today, the first port of call is going to be to go towards some water holes. I must just also state that um, if I'm looking slightly off colour, it is not because I'm about to vomit from seasickness, it is because I have had... I have put some very fancy uh, homemade sunscreen on, uh, provided by Rebecca. Uh, Re Apparently normal sunscreen isn't very, actually very good for you at all. It contains nasty chemicals. And so this thing is made of coconut oil and various other things. Uh, but the problem with it is that it makes you look like Casper the Friendly Ghost. And so I need to rub it in very carefully before drive. Otherwise I look like, well, a zombie basically. Let me turn this down a bit. Everybody's now getting mobile which means there is a vast noise in my ear. Hello, Anne. Yes, you say, do we ever see otters? We do see otters, you know. Uh, we see something called the Cape Clawless Otter, and we find them in the Sand River. I've definitely seen them there. I've seen their tracks often. They're not common, but they are around. So in any of the perennial rivers of the Kruger National Park, you could easily find a Cape Clawless Otter. I've lost the tree genre. Everybody needs it as a reference, you see. There we are. You can show them again. Very nice. The leaf is uh, fairly indistinct, like I say. It's what they call simple and opposite, which means that it's just about the same as all the other trees out here. I haven't tasted of much. It's starting to irritate me now. I hope you've had a good look. One doesn't want to be irritated on a hot day, does one, John Ray? How do you feel about tracking a butterfly? Because it's hanging at the moment in a tree, immobile. Oh, now it's flown. It's behind this tree. It was quite a spectacular fellow. It was one of the Chiraxes. I'm not sure which one. I shall find a Chiraxes to show you. While we drive, we shall keep going in order to keep the gentle breeze blowing over our faces. Ah! Now, Justin, you're wondering about the largest moth found on the reserve as I try and find this flutterby for you. The largest moth, Justin, is probably a Mapani moth or a lunar moth. Well, length to length, it'll be a lunar moth, which looks like... Andre, don't try this at home. See, you can only drive and read a book if you're very experienced like me. There. 
The lunar moth is number four, that's him there. And he is probably, how tall is he? 120 millimeter wingspan, so that's 12 centimeters, which is just shy of six inches, just shy of six inches of wingspan. That's the lunar moth. So that's the biggest one. Then what I think that butterfly was, everybody, was, hold on, genre, <laughs> a foxy chiraxes. I think it was one of those rather spectacular looking things. Isn't that nice? The top right hand corner there. The foxy chiraxes. So that's what I think it was, but unfortunately I was unable to find it before it flew away. Well, I was unable to show Genre where it was before it flew away. Right, we are now approaching the road that will lead us to the water of a triple in a row three waters. Or three in a row pan, I think is the shortening, shortened word, or shortened term. <laughs> and we'll see what's there just around the corner. So Foxy Chiraxes and Lunar Moth. Nobody has come up with any answers for my tree, Judy H. Don't let me down. You've been so marvellously good at uh, telling me all the things I don't know. Some Impala there. Quite a few Impala. In fact, Sorry, John Dre. I'm just going to go back a bit here because before we get to the water, there's a rather impressive skeleton. In fact, almost an entire one. I'm sort of tempted to try and steal it for the tent. It's quite big, isn't it? There it is, everybody. There, a buffalo died. It was killed, I think, by lions some time back. But that would be rather good to hang from the roof of the tent, don't you think, John? Like a whale, sort of like a whale skeleton in a museum. But a buffalo. And his jaw is intact. Most of his ribs are intact. This really would be quite a good one. Unfortunately, he is an Ankoro buffalo. And so I can't really walk on there and drape him over the bonnet and then drive home with him. Somebody would smell a rat, as it were. Or, more to the point, they would not smell the carcass. Right, that's enough of that death genre. Let's go to something living, hopefully, at the pan. There were some Impala in there, but they're in Coral, in coral Impala. So we won't look at them. Hello Dana, you're a new viewer and it's lovely to hear from you and thank you for asking a question. Um, just next time please tell us where you're from, it's always nice to know where you're from. Dana, you say do we have problems with poachers on the reserve? From time to time, yes we do, there are incursions. Uh, mostly it's people who are very hungry and looking for something to feed their families with. So there is a 60% unemployment rate in much of the communities that live on the western fringes of the Kruger Park. And for those people obviously there is a food resource in here that they're not allowed access to. And so some people will try and come in and collect animals for the pot. That then has a negative knock-on effect of course because the way they catch animals is to set snares, which is a very painful process for any animal to go through and it also catches indiscriminately so it catches the predators and it catches things like elephants trunks we've seen a number of elephants here that are missing their trunks um, and so yes in short there are there is a small poaching issue but it's pretty much under control and it doesn't happen much in this particular area further north where the policing isn't quite so good then the problem is that much higher but that is to be expected. As, um, as I've said before, game reserves throughout Africa are highly conflicted places. And they're conflicted places, Dana, because, of course, they weren't necessary 
until the advent of the co colonialists and the settlers came in and we started blasting away with our guns. Uh, you know, the, the local harvesting of animals here was entirely sustainable. And it was only through the advent of sort of white settlers and their guns that it became necessary to proclaim game reserves and that excluded a whole lot of people who had been using this natural resource for many centuries. So it is quite a conflicted space, that of conservation. I cannot actually believe that there is nothing here whatsoever. There's an impala. I was expecting to find a great gathering of animals. No. One blacksmith lapwing. Right, well nothing there. Let's go across to Jamie. She's got a very beautiful antelope to show you. I will go to the next waterhole. Such a beautiful animal that it made it to Lissa's top five of most beautiful creatures out here, excluding big five in brackets, the kudu. And you can see what Liss means when you look at them with their enormous ears and their beautiful bright big eyes. They are absolutely truly stunning antelope. And Teresa of course was the viewer that told me the story about how the white stripes on a kudu and nyala and a bushbuck, the stripes and the spots were put there by the gods reaching down because kudu and nyala's legs were too skinny to hold them up and so the creators reached down and picked them up and the white spots were left wherever the gods hands had touched them it's one of my favorite local legends i would never heard that one before i started working at safari live and it is definitely one of my absolute favorite stories it's got such a beautiful ring to it, particularly with Nyala and their white dots. And there we go. And as always with Kudu, the longer you look, the more you see. There's probably a herd of about at least five or six of them here, but most of them are on the other side of the dam wall, <laughs> which means us having to move out of the shade that we're in, which we're not quite prepared to do just yet. see the ox pickers racing around at the back getting to those sensitive spots where the ticks love to gather oh nearly got a smack in the face with the tail there you've got to be alert when you're an ox picker you never know when that fast moving tail is going to sweep aside and smack you the ox pickers of course for newer viewers are the birds that sit on the backs of the antelope and the buffalo and help them remove the ticks from their skin, from their fur. And off he goes. There is also, while I've been sitting here, I've noticed there's a few vervet monkeys running about. And this particular group that lives around Voyatella Dam, and we do know it's the same group, this particular group has always been a little bit skittish around vehicles, but I'm going to try and get us a bit closer. I'm hoping that most of them are feeding off the fruit of that big jackalberry tree on the dam wall. Now let's go and investigate and see. I also decided I'd pop my head round here because last night on the Sunset Safari in Chila, the female leopard that we've only recently started seeing came through to the pan for a drink, which suggests to us the possibility that she has a kill somewhere in this region which is why she's been hanging around over the last three or so days what's today tuesday yes so sunday afternoon is when she was last seen so i thought i'd poke my nose over the wall and just see whether or not she's around haven't heard any alarm calls from the monkeys they of course are always one of the first giveaways when there's a leopard about investigate. I'm sure she does. I'm sure that she has a kill somewhere down here on the other side of the dam wall. Just in this thick drainage line area. Where could she be hiding? 
oh cute Brian sorry before we go into the shade here's a tiny little Inyala drinking there uh, so cute I will move us to the shade in a moment look at the little one so tiny afternoon no updates yet I haven't been back to check on those three middle Dengala uh, just Columbia and Love on Twin Dams Road Cute man, there you go on James's list of top five most beautiful animal. Sorry, Ephraim's trying to talk to me now. Negative Ephraim, um, there's no sign of them around Gary Cutline and Rexon is trying to track them down around Rebecca's Road. Look how tiny you are. So, as I said, on James's list of a top five most beautiful animals and you can see why okay let's go forward a little bit into the shade <laughs> let's see if there's any monkeys still remaining in the top of this tree monkeys I think they've all scampered off. It's interesting because you'd expect these ones to be relatively used to vehicles and peoples. There's always constant vehicle traffic. But I don't see any one of them left. I think they must all have moved off. Promise you I saw monkeys here. You did right, Brian. I did indeed. You did, okay, so I'm not I'm not completely crazy. <coughs> the mysterious vanishing monkeys. That's aha! I see you! <laughs> I see you little things. Hiding there in the shade. Here we go. There are monkeys there. They're also keeping themselves busy, even though it's very hot for them. It's not too bad. The smaller the animal, the easier it is for them to cope with the heat. Just easier to lose heat. And there they go, slowly disappearing off into the distance. And now the more I sit and look, the more I start to see them every now and again just poking their heads out of the leaves and the branches. Most of them, unfortunately, have disappeared off already. I don't see any little ones, but Ruth, you were wondering about whether or not monkeys give birth on the ground or in trees. To the best of my knowledge, almost all monkey births are in trees. And baboon births as well as far as I know. It's quite rare for a, a, a primate of the, the sort of the smaller primates to actually give birth on the ground. So Ruth, yep, it'll be up in the trees. It's amazing to think that the man, they actually managed to do that. It seems to be the way though. The same goes for bush babies. So our smaller form of primates, our smaller nocturnal primates, they also give birth in trees. Except I'm not 100% sure about the greater Galago or the greater bush baby. I'm not sure if they, they, they often spend a little bit more time on the ground. So there's a possibility that the females give birth down there. But I don't think so. I think it makes the most sense for the, the babies or the mothers when they're at their most vulnerable to be up in a tree. Unfortunately, as much as I love, I really love looking at monkeys, they've all vanished. Fortunately for us, James has had a little bit more luck and he's got uh, some horses in pyjamas for you. Some kudu, everybody, and they're standing in the remnants of what was known as Cheetah Plains Pan, which is now Cheetah Plains Wallow. I'm not sure why they've stopped pumping this pan, but they've had a good drink and they're now wandering off through the clearings. There was one ruminating in the shade there on the left-hand side. 
That's him there, Jean-Dre. She's stooden up. Stooden is not a word. She has stood up, is what I meant to say. The sun is boiling my brain. And that is because we are not used to the heat just yet. And then also, it's a rather pretty scene that, I mean, despite the fact that the light, the light, I can't speak, the light is about as harsh as a welding torch. It's still pretty pretty. And there was also a zebra just across the way there. Can you see the zebra, Andre? He's just hiding behind a small apple leaf bushel. Now, if you, you are... Yeah, zoom in on that dead thing in the middle there. There, you got him. Down a bit, you'll see him. There he is. you see him. There we are, everybody, the striped pyjama pony. Hiding behind the bush, stalking the kudu, waiting to see if they get any closer. Then he'll make his move and grab one for his dinner. Hello, Brian in Toronto. You want to know if the drought has caused the death of any animals? That is a good question, but it's interesting because in this particular area, no, I don't believe it has. In the Greater Kruger National Park, absolutely, there have been a number of hippopotamus that have suffered. They, unsurprisingly, or the, some of the first to suffer when the water sources dry out and there's nothing left for them to drink or live in. So, yes, the hippos have suffered. But also, in the reserves that are not open systems, like this one, for example, there has been quite a lot of die-off and quite a lot of effect. Uh, and certainly the most obvious example would be the reserves near Hutzbreit, which I've mentioned before. Um, they're all closed off from the Kruger, so they're sort of self-contained. But because they're self-contained and the animal movements are that much more limited and the balance is kept by human beings, and let that be a lesson to us all, rather than the actual natural system keeping the balance of how many of each individual species there is, what happens then is that you do get this imbalance and the warthogs, for example, they look absolutely horrendous. They're looking ribby and they're going to die. I've no, no doubt there are going to be many, many warthog deaths. Um, I imagine probably the buffalo, similar sort of situation. So it really does depend where you are. But around here, I would say no, nothing has died of the drought yet. The elephants look, for me, looking the most ropey of the animals that we get here. And I'm astounded I haven't managed to find one elephant seeking out some water here. Our next port, of course, is going to be to go down south there into the clearings. There's a nice water hole there on the boundary with Mala Mala. And we'll see if there isn't an elephant there, perhaps, or a cheetah. Right, shall we carry on, Jean-Ray? Hello, Aaron in New Zealand. I'm just trying to work out what time it must be for you, Aaron, in New Zealand. I'm imagining about nine hours ahead of us. Is my right? Seven or eight, says Jean-Ray. Aaron, I'm going to say nine. Please just send through a tweet saying nine, regardless if it is or isn't. Um, you want to know which animals are most, or which antelope are most closely related to kudu? Uh, well, there are a number here. We get two. One being the bushbuck, the other being the nyala. They belong to the same genus. And then, sorry, this is very loud in my ear. And then there is the eland, which is part of the same family which we don't get here, and there is the mountain yala, which we don't get here, and then the bongo is another obvious one. All of those things found north of our borders. Well, the eelunt you can, in theory, find here, uh, but I've never seen an eelunt in the Sabi sand. Many, of course, in the Mara, where <laughs> I have just been. But those are the main ones. The only two here, the bushbuck and the nyala. There is a crowned lapwing. Kirsten said something sardonic there, but mercifully I missed it. Ooh. So the lovely call of the white crested helmet shrike. Not the best crowned lapwing sighting in the world, is it, John? Yeah. No, let's move on.
Go again with that, Kirsten, please. It sounds very interesting, but I missed it. Buffalo. Ah, the deciduous London plane tree is what uh, Betty says it is. So thank you very much for that. That was the tree, the mystery tree. And the genus again was what, Kirsten? Platanus. Now, Platanus was the genus. We'll, I just I can't hear quite properly there. Thank you very much for that, Betty. This is a very interesting arrangement of buffalo because it is, strictly speaking, a breeding herd. You see that, Jandre? One bull in the front, one cow behind, a young bull next to her, another bull behind, sort of a semi-sub-adult bull behind that, looking at us now on the left-hand side of the screen, and then another cow deeply aged behind that. This is a very sorry herd of buffalo. They are not looking good. They look very unhealthy. They've all got their hips showing. So maybe I spoke a little bit too soon about who was showing the effects of the drought and who isn't. But I don't think these chaps look very good at all. I think they look quite rough. And it's very odd that a breeding herd would be one, two, three, four, five, six animals. It's extremely unusual. It's so unusual to the point of being... I mean, it's, it's bizarre. I've never seen it before. So I wonder... Normally what you tell people, of course, is that the herds get bigger during the dry season because the food and the water become more concentrated. But I wonder if when things get even more dry and more d dispersed, I wonder if those big herds don't then break up into much smaller groups so that it's just a little bit easier to find what little there is left to eat. Do you see how ribby they look? They really don't look very good at all, poor chaps. They'll be hoping desperately for some rain before two months' time. So, Andre, when did you say you thought we'd get rain? 18th of September. When? October. I said October the 15th, I think. Shame, the one at the back there seems to have a bit of a slack jaw. Uh, I said the 10th of October, apparently. Thank you for that, Kirsten. Shame, you see the one at the back there? His uh, bottom lip is either hanging open or perhaps is an injury from being attacked by lions. It's quite possible that it's been kind of pulled down. Hmm. It's rather interesting, that is. I haven't seen buffalo on Juma that look like that, but for one bull who hangs around at the Vuyatela pan. So that's a little bit sad. Let's continue down the way. But that is the way of things in a drought. Many zebra tracks here. Can't tell you where the elephants have gone. It really is rather strange. Jandre described this area as Chobi yesterday. Elephants everywhere they looked. Mobile today. They were heading towards Kruger yesterday, says Jandre. That's that way. <laughs> now, Pajamas Patterson has headed across to the cats from this morning. The cats from this morning are doing what cats do in the heat of the day, and that is, well, not a great deal. Not a great deal indeed. Our Birmingham boys from this morning are fast asleep. They are so warm that one of them's actually almost attempted to climb into the quarry bush in order to find some shade. He really has, I mean, he's got his head right inside it. The other is using the one as a footrest. A great place to pop its foot, its feet. There you go, you can see what I mean about the one with its head hidden in the quarry bush with a paw resting on one of the branches. 
a most comfortable spot. And they have not shifted one little bit from, no, that's not true. They've moved with the shade since this morning. Obviously, as the shade has shifted around, they've got too hot and got up and moved around. This morning, for those of you who missed the sunrise safari, they were apparently, just before we found them, they had been chasing buffalo. There's the third one, all the way at the back there. And they were chasing buffalo around. They do have very, very empty bellies. Sorry, I'm just listening to the game drive comms, the game drive radio, so that I can get updates on what's happening. Okay. This is just chat just listening to Rex and chat about the fact he found some tracks of leopard going towards the Galago waterhole. It could well be in Chila, but I couldn't hear exactly whether or not he found tracks for a female or a male. So for those of you who missed the sunrise safari, just to chat a little bit about that, obviously we had the Birmingham boys on the move, heading straight towards Simbabili. Luckily for us, they decided to flop down in the shade, not more than 200 meters or so from our boundary. And there they have found the most comfortable of spots. The fourth Birmingham boy we have since found out is on Buffel's Hook, mating with one of the Inkahumas. Uh, Aubrey, sorry, just to let you know, I'm on lock with the three Birminghams. They're still in the same position. Sorry, everybody. Just making sure that Aubrey doesn't arrive and get a serious surprise when I'm here. He did say that he was on his way. Everybody's going out now. This, temperatures are slowly starting to cool down this afternoon, which means that the guests are ready to go out and about on their safaris. The first thing they're going to be doing is coming to have a look at these lions. I don't think we're going to spend the entire time with them. I, th I just wanted to pop in, check that they were still around, and then what we'll do is, depending on how things go, we'll probably return here at the end of the sunset safari, when there's a better chance of them getting up and doing some things. That's the Birmingham boy with the skinny tail. And since our lions are not going to be up to terribly much, and we know what wonderful value the fantastic animals of Cheetah Plains are, let's go across to James and find out how he's doing. Pippet! The pippet, everybody. A striped pippet! I just like to say the word pipit as many times as possible. Pip, 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 pipit. Pip, pip, pip. It's a striped pipit and it is wandering across the clearings. It is not alone in these clearings, everybody. Uh, it is, in fact, accompanied uh, by a, sorry, not a striped pipit, a grassfelt or African pipit. I've done that twice before, mistaken the two. In a grassfelt or African pipit. Not striped. And a steenbok. Thank you for the steenbok, Chandra. Very nice. The steenbok is not alone either. It has a mate somewhere not too far from here in the Mala Mala. It seems to have gone there, doesn't it, Chandra? And this is this the same steenbok that you saw yesterday, Chandra? No, this is the female. This is the female. Ah. But probably the wife. But probably the wife. Uh -huh. Chandra is expertise in steenbok behavior goes to being able to tell who is married to whom. Very good, John Ray. Mm. And it is now, of course, eating the little bits of greenery that are left in this once pumped pan. I think it was pumped 
either that or it's a very there, there might be a natural well coming out here but it was wet until quite recently there's quite a lot of water in it and I saw some giraffe drinking from here then way in the background some kudus some male kudus they look very magnificent indeed but all around you can see that the landscape and the sky is still rather bleached and as the sun eventually begins to make its way towards the west so hopefully this light will soften um, jean -Ray, you can't keep coming back to me when I have my leg out of the car it's slightly unprofessional I feel not to mention skinny it's not that bad right what we're going to do now is head towards the Kruger boundary and then head north up the eastern boundary and we'll see if we can't find in Kanyeni or something like that over there. The main purpose of that little jaunt is going to be to get some cooling air on our faces and um, hopefully some shade. Well, there's not a lot of shade around here. Oh, bird up there is a Wahlberg's eagle genre. Hello, Lane and Michelle. You say that the Steenbock is part of your beautiful five. Well, I think that's very pleasing. I think he's also rather a special animal. I'm not sure he'd make my beautiful five, maybe my elegant five. Now, how do we identify that as a Wahlberg's eagle, everybody? You might ask yourself, good grief, that man James, he's able to identify a Wahlberg's eagle at an astonishing distance. And actually, it's very simple. It's simply that it has a very thin tail. You noticed that. Very thin tail. All the others, even the tawny eagle, which looks almost identical if you see it flying at that distance, the tail is not thin like that. If you see my hands together, the tail will be slightly fanned like that. But the Wahlberg's eagle is almost parallel, or the two sides are completely parallel, and hardly ever fans more than that, whereas a tawny will fan to that if it's turning in the wind. That is how you identify the Wahlberg's eagle at a great distance. Now also up here is a very angry and upset lilac-breasted roller, which is sitting here in a sort of huff, going quack, 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 quack. It's over here. Oh, don't fly away. Now just watch it carefully. Let's see if it does its display. This could be quite cool. Watch this. Watch, watch, watch. <laughs> I said could be quite cool. Oh, whoa, we go. Brilliant. Did you get a genre? You get him. <coughs> Stop co get, getting consumption and watch the watch the roller. Let's see if he does it again. How cool was that? Very cool. So, I know, did you actually film it doing its thing or half of it. half of it? Well, well done. And then you became sick, did you? Yes. Yes. You started getting tuberculosis. That is very irritating. Never mind. Let's go further on. That's really actually quite cool. They don't normally do it at that distance. They normally do it much higher up. <laughs> One chance we get. Poor old genre has a coughing fit. There he goes again. And there's two of them going now. This one's going to go. Watch this one in front of us. Yes, here he goes. Just keep on him. Don't worry about the others. There he goes. You see that rolling? That is so cool. Well done, Jandri. Not easy. Very difficult, that. Alrighty. Let's continue on our way. <laughs> That's very cool. That's why they're called rollers, everyone. For that very rolling reason. And 
There is a yellow-billed hornbill eating, I suspect, termites. Hello, Andrew. Uh, my commiserations to you. You say you've just found Safari Live on YouTube and it is now distracting you from your work. Andrew, no work can be as important as a safari, as appreciating the wilderness, so please don't worry about that. Secondly, it is the best thing to have if you work in an office, for example. Um, I believe that uh, the world's the world would be a better place were there less, you know, were there to be less corporate meetings. And so, what I suggest you do is load the YouTube stream onto your mobile device, uh, go into your next meeting, and just watch it, um, and just nod sort of every so often when somebody says something to you, and that will make work that much more tolerable. Now, you're going to hear a bit of noise. That's me slapping flies. Hornbill. Now, I'm trying to see what he's eating. I'm pretty sure it's little termites that have been digging in amongst the buffalo and kudu dung there, or wildebeest also. And again, I'm just astounded by the amazing dexterity and accuracy with which that bill is able to be landed on the ground. If you are, you know, slightly underwhelmed by what you're seeing here, what I suggest you do is next time you go past some roadworks, uh, steal one of the traffic cones and go home and then attach it to the front of your face. Then, <laughs> Put a small target on the ground in front of you, get down on all fours and see how accurately you can hit that small target with the traffic cone attached to the front of your face. And I assure you, you will end up with either a very sore face because you will hit it much harder than you think you're going to and you will also miss your target. I wouldn't suggest you do it with any sort of close personal friends or family. They will think you've gone stark raving out of your head. Maybe you could have a party, actually, a hornbill party, where everyone has to arrive with a cone attached to the front of their faces, and you're only allowed to eat through your cone. What do you think, John? Do you think that's a brilliant idea? I think that's a very good idea. <laughs> I think that's an excellent idea. Come to my hornbill party, bring your own traffic cone. <laughs> In all seriousness, it really is quite impressive that it's able to do that. Ah, James Richard, no, you're absolutely correct. You say you take it that the new sunscreen that was given to me by Rebecca doesn't, in fact, um, act as an insect repellent. No, in fact, it would seem to act as an insect attractant. This is one great joy of the winter is the lack of flies. Oh, and I had a dreadful incident yesterday evening, everybody. If you're squeamish, you might want to turn the sound down slightly. I lay down on my bed, lay my weary head on the pillow, and a fly landed on my forehead. So I hit it. And it uh, was a very sluggish fly, and it fell onto the ground, and I was very satisfied that I had killed it. And then, as one does, I sort of scratched my nose before I shut my eyes for the final time, and the smell that assailed my nostrils from the tips of my fingers that had made a contact with the fly was quite disgusting. And this is because Stefan has found us a very effective fly trap that is um, made of some kind of, I don't know what kind of disgusting, stinking stuff it is, but uh, that fly had managed to escape from the fly trap and come and sa sat on my face. And I think that's why it was so sluggish. Anyway, that was my fly story for the evening. You may now turn your sound back up again for the more squeamish of you.
It's not out of the top drawer of stories, that is it? No. I've told better ones. Yes. I wonder if... Have we got the... Do we have the crickets yet? We have downloaded some cricket sounds, everybody. <laughs> We're on the far eastern boundary now, everybody. Where the blinding volcanic heat has made everything scuttle off under some kind of cover. Hello RJ, in California you say the area all looks the same, do we ever get lost? Not anymore RJ, because yes, while it does look the same on first sight, it doesn't once you've been driving around for a while, um, each piece of the reserve, especially, you know, we drive around these areas so often that, no, they don't, it's almost impossible to get lost on the little piece of land that we drive on. But, if you go to a new area and perhaps you drive on a much bigger area, so, for example, if you were to be driving on Mala Mala permanently, which is about 18,000 hectares, you could definitely get lost there, especially at night, if you were driving off-road, let's say, or if you happen to be driving on a very cloudy day and you were driving off-road quite a lot, and you can suddenly find yourself totally disorientated, and then you can get a bit lost. But if you drive in a straight direction, or in one direction for any length of time, you're going to hit a road, and normally you will you'll recognize the road. Have you seen in Kanyeni anywhere, Jandre? No, I haven't either. What I think we'll do now, everyone, is go back towards those water holes and see if the elephants haven't emerged. And if they haven't, well, we we'll might just make our way back to Juma and see if Karula hasn't come back across. <laughs> I'm quite astounded by the absence of heartbeat over here. Oh, and Mandy, you want to know if anyone's seen Shadow's Cub? And the answer, I'm afraid, is no, I don't think so. I've certainly heard nothing about Shadow's Cub at all. So I don't know where she is, little Zara. Um, I had tracks of Tingana and I think probably Shadow on Arethusa this morning, but there certainly wasn't any cub with them. So I don't know what's going to happen there. Well, I think I'm pretty sure we know what's going to happen there, and it's not very nice. I don't see any elephants at the pan there. So we'll go back around, I think, to three in a row pan. What is that over there? It's a log. How exciting. <laughs> I am amazed by the lack of heartbeat in this clearing. Let's turn down this way. There's a starling, thank goodness, Jandre. I think it's a starling. Hmm? The yeah, Arola. Yep. A flying roller. No, it doesn't want to see us either. Times like this, Jandre, that one must stop and talk about a tree. Just wait, sorry. I just saw a whole lot of dust coming up there. Did you see that? Yeah, let's carry on going that way at one o'clock there, yes. Joey in Australia, I'm afraid I missed your question. Oh, you say, did we ever see wattled lapwings? We don't. Wattled lapwings are not usual here. I I've seen one here before. I think I've seen one. I've seen one actually at Ngala, not too far from here, which was north of us. Um, but I haven't seen anything other. Oh, it's, you know what it is. That dust is that herd of buffalo that have come to the water. So let's go back across there. So, Joey, one wattled lapwing. They're more, uh, they need kind of wetter areas normally. What have you got, Jandre? Impala in the shade. Good. Reef our cup war runneth over much in the same way as the elephants were hiding in the shade, so the impala are hiding in the shade. Now, interestingly, this little situation here of 
small group of impala on the edge of the woodland fringing a clearing is how those antelope operate in the Mara. There are very few of them, well comparatively few of them, and they live in these tiny little herds, sort of three or four or five or six individuals, not the massive herds that you get here. I winged that fly, Jean Ray, now it's dead. I am a bully, yes. Let's go and see how those buffalo are doing at the water. I think they're rolling in the mud and tossing the dust about the place. Ah, oh, much hyena tracks. Yeah, Liz, exactly. You say hopefully these wheat buff will mean more of or more food to eat for the sticks pride and I think that's exactly what will happen. Now the reason I'm stopping quite so interestedly for these kudu is I think they probably are here not only for the browse but because there is an old carcass. I wonder if they haven't been eating the bones. It's the same group of kudu that were at the water hole there. And there uh, the bones. Now can you hear that? Just just have a listen for fifteen seconds. Absolutely nothing. Isn't that amazing? It's bleached hot to the extent that not even the birds will sing to us. I'm sure that will change as we go towards the evening. <laughs> now while we go up and see what those buffalo are doing at the waterhole there, let's go back across to Jamie, whose lions apparently are maybe snoring. That's the amount of activity they're giving us. Sadly, no snores emanating from our lions. They're doing a little bit of twitching every now and again, but that is pretty much that. And I'm going to leave in the next few minutes and then return to them as the sun starts to go down. And I just thought we'd spend a little bit more time in the presence of the magnificent Birmingham boys. Who, I must say, look terribly dignified in sleep. Except for that one, it looks a little bit jowly. Is he the one with the injured... It's not the one with the injury, no. It's just the way that his lip has fallen. Looks very strange. Looks weird. Why does it look so peculiar? It's not the one with the... One of them, of course, has an injured lip that's split away to reveal his canine. But if I remember correctly, that was the top lip, not the bottom one. I think it's just the way that his mouth is stretched out over his teeth. It does look very strange, though. Otherwise, they couldn't look more comfortable as if they tried. And hello to Anne in the USA. You've been looking at, and actually we, we focused on one particular ball of ticks this morning that was truly revolting. And Anne was saying she's seen lots of ticks on the lions and that there in the USA that means Lyme disease. And what kind of effect do the ticks have on our lions here? Fortunately for us, our ticks do not carry Lyme disease. We do not have a problem with Lyme disease here in South Africa, for which we are all exceptionally grateful, and as having been victim to many, many tick bites um, throughout our lives in the bush, and we're very grateful. What they do pass on is a bacteria known as, oh, <laughs> little nip movement there, a bacteria called Rickettsia. There's different strains of it commonly known as tick bite fever. Human beings get it. The lions have an incredible resistance to it. In fact, they have a resistance to most of the tick-borne diseases. They can act as a vector for other diseases like TB, 
but chances are the lions are, if they're going to be carriers of those disease, are carriers already, rather than it being passed along by a tick bite. Uh, for the most part, the ticks actually don't do them any kind of major harm. If a lion loses condition and starts to feel particularly bad, um, whether it's through injury or through some kind of other disease, then what you'll usually find, and actually this applies to all animals, not just lions, is that their tick parasite load automatically gets much, much higher. There's lots and lots and lots of them. And they start to de dehydrate that animal much quicker than they might otherwise. So essentially hastening the, process, the entire process of their demise if they are injured or ill in some way. But other than that, the ticks don't have a tremendously negative effect on the animal. They're uncomfortable, they're itchy, they're often in horrible places. They tend to congregate, for example, around the animal's eyes or the more sensitive groin areas. And they always look so incredibly uncomfortable. But they're not doing any major harm. But you do sometimes look at it and just wish you could spray them with something to get rid of them. Having fallen victim to many, many tick bites, I sympathize. The flies as well are also going to start to slowly get more and more overwhelming in number. And speaking of parasites, from the external to the internal, Justin, every lion has a tapeworm or some kind of parasite in its digestive system. They are unhy unhygienic eaters, you know, not that that's their fault, but they are not picky when it comes to the food that they eat. They eat all kinds of rotting meat. We've seen the Yinkahumas push their heads into green, slimy buffalo carcasses before. Oh, sorry, I just made myself feel a little bit ill there. So all lions have um, parasites. It's one of the reasons why you don't, even when a lion is anaesthetized, you don't want to touch it with your bare hands. Obviously, if it's not anaesthetized, please don't touch it with your bare hands because it will kill you. But if it's anaesthetized, you wear gloves. Vets wear gloves whenever they deal with them because they can transmit some very, very nasty things in their saliva and through their gastric juices. Well, I've spoken about this before, but I've had the opportunity to examine lion vomit a few times. They often vomit, they often get upset stomachs, and almost invariably you will find some kind of intestinal worm or parasite. Some, anything from tapeworms to flatworms to... Oh, it's revolting. It really, truly is. Ugh. It's so horrible. So they all do. And the same applies to leopards, hyenas. All of our predators out here will have really major intestinal worms and parasites. Lions are not fussy. None of our predators are, except perhaps cheetah. They tend to be a little bit more fussy. They generally don't scavenge. Although that's probably more to do with the fact that scavenging puts them at risk of running into bigger, stronger scavengers something like a hyena or a lion, which they'd rather avoid, which is probably more the reason why they only eat fresh kills. These boys, speaking of kills, are definitely going to be on the search for one tonight. When they were walking along this morning, they were we could see the flap of skin between their back legs, which immediately tells you that this is a hungry lion. I used to work with a research, research organization. We used to grade the different sort of stomach fullness in terms of one to four. Four being that they've swallowed a beach ball and one is the opposite, which is what I would describe these lions as now. I'm going to leave them because they're not going to be doing any hunting or indeed any anything over the next few moments. We'll come back to them towards the end of the sunset safari. In the meantime, let's go find out where James is off to on his afternoon stroll. If there is nothing in the waterhole, you've got to put something in the waterhole, and in this case, that is me. And what I found in here was a butterfly, and I was trying to catch it. You can still see it over there. It's an acria, beautiful orange acria. Slightly into the water here, and I, I've bemuddied my shoes, uh, a bit like Jean-Dre did the other day with his slop. 
and it's you stop up better um, it's in here because for the same reason that the buffalo came in here it's because it needs to drink and some of these butterflies I think probably hatched a bit early anyway this pan is now being pumped again I can see the water is trickling slowly in and so it'll probably be full by tomorrow the buffalo have moved off they had moved off by the time we got here uh, they moved up a little bit more quickly when they saw me get out of the car. Look, Jandre, do you see? Jandre wanted me to get into the middle of the dam and actually lie there, uh, but I thought it might be very uncomfortable, so I didn't. Anyway, the main thing that got that started was Jandre saying, what's that scraggly tree over there that hasn't been eaten? And the answer is, it is a quarry bush, which should have been obvious to both of us just by the virtue of the fact that it's still green and on the side of a waterhole, but it has been mangled by the elephants at various stages. Alrighty, we're going to go back to three in a row pan, as I said, and see what we can find there. Stay open door. Thank you. Hello James Richard, you say since I am the Mara expert, which is of course um, not true, I've been in the Mara for two days, so I'm hardly a Mara expert, you say would, we be, would it be possible for us to see a baobab tree, your favourite tree? No. James, it's too high up, its altitude is almost a mile high, and that's too high up, sorry Jean-Dre, it's too high up for baobab trees, I also think it's too wet. So I'm afraid no baobab trees, but lots of very attractive what we call sh shepherd's bushes. I'm not sure which boskia species it is, but there is a boskia species there that grows in a, well, sort of on its own and in the plains, and it's just beautiful and wonderful for climbing. So I shall have to do a bit more climbing of the boskia trees there. There's an impala, which we're not going to stop for. He's in the, in the wood. Hello Gracie, age 9, you say you had to tell someone today about the Togolosh and you're a bit worried perhaps that you got the story a bit mixed up and can I tell you where it's from again? Well the Togolosh is, a, I think it's originally a Zulu story, Itogoloshi and Itogoloshi was a very small man, only about a meter or three foot three high It's quite interesting some elephant dung being fed on by some hornbills, but also it looks like a buffalo rib. So Gracie Itogoloshi was about a metre high, but also apparently uh, he's very, he's quite nasty, he comes in the night and he will take away young children. And in order to avoid him taking away young children, what you have to do is put your bed on top of some bricks and then he's, because he's so short, he won't be able to get on top. So that's how you avoid being taken by Itogoloshi. This is indeed a buffalo rib. How it got here, I don't really understand. But it's not impossible that an elephant picked it up and carried it here and deposited it the same time that it deposited this. This was obviously a very large bull elephant given the size of the bolus that came up. Now, let's see if we can't find what those hornbills were eating. It's a little couple of days in the sun before it smells any good. I don't know what the hornbills were eating. There were a couple of flies that flew out of it, but yeah, you know, they're just tiny, tiny. Here we go. Here we go. Andre, um, try and find you one. There's some very tiny little flies. Tell me if you see any. Flying. No, sort of st sitting, walking around on the surface. You might find one or two. 
anything. I think we might have a couple of flies. So I think they're picking up those flies. Then I'll show you on my arm. There's a beetle. There's a beetle. See on my arm there, Andre. It's caught amongst the hairs, and that's what the hornbills will be eating. Those flies and beetles and ants and termites and things that come to feed on the elephant dung. And of course, the elephant dung full of moisture. And that will be very useful for a number of animals, including Stefan Winterboer, who has been known to squeeze an elephant dung into a snail's shell and drink that. Uh, I'm not going to do the same thing. Chandra, have you done that before? You've, uh, you, you're not squeamish about eating new things, but you haven't done that yet. Well, maybe you should. On we go. Just wonder why an elephant would have picked that up. While I think about that, Jamie's moved on from the lions on account of the fact that they were about to anaesthetize her into a coma. She's gone off to find something slightly more interesting. We're going to head towards three in a row pan. <laughs>